Okay, so I'll be solving example 3.2 in this video, which is the force required to hold an elbow in place. And that's an elbow for a piping system, not from your arm. And this example goes together with video number eight, where we looked at the momentum equation for inertial control volumes, or put another way, that's force balances for control volumes that are not accelerating. So this piping elbow we'll see is not accelerating. Okay, let's get to it. So there's a 90 degree elbow shown here. We come across this quite a bit in practice. Actually, many kitchen sink attachments, for example, have a 90 degree elbow like this. And so we're, we might be familiar with this in practice, right? So if your fitting on your sink is a little bit loose and you turn the water on, you can see sort of a kickback. So we already know there's some pretty substantial fluid forces going on there in that elbow because of the water flowing through it. So let's go ahead and do a calculation here and maybe you'll look differently tonight as you uh, turn on your taps in your sinks. You can watch or you can feel, you can put your hand there and feel some of that kickback, some of these forces at play. So this says water flows steadily through this 90 degree reducing elbow shown in the figure there. At the inlet, the pressure is 220 kPa, cross-sectional area 0 0.01 meters squared. At the outlet, there at 0.2, the cross-sectional area is 0 0.0025 meters squared and the velocity is 16 meters per second. It's saying this elbow discharges to the atmosphere, just so saying it's surrounded by atmospheric pressure, which is uh, to be expected. And then we have to determine the force required to hold that elbow in place. Okay, we're given a figure there. So first thing we'll wanna do is label up this figure. If you're not given a figure, you should probably draw a figure as your first thing. But we'll go ahead and label this and make sure we understand everything that's going on here based on what's given. So I'll first draw our control volume. So that control volume encompasses our elbow there. So we'll be able to figure out the forces. And we have now two control surfaces at point one and point two there. So we'll write down what we're given about those two points. And direction is very important, as you can imagine. So we've got our coordinate axes labeled here, X and Y. So when I write V2 there, I'm careful to notice, so based on the directions we're given, that's a negative velocity because it's downwards. And I list the J there because it's denoting that it's in the Y direction. That's why I wrote that as negative 16 J uh, meters per second at V2. And I'm doing that so it'll be easier to sub in later so I can really demonstrate to you uh, the best way to solve these questions. All right, so next let's get to our governing equations. Really the distinguishing feature in the, writing the governing equations is oftentimes whether we have a uniform velocity or not. So we were given at point two there that the velocity is 16 meters per second, indicating again, we're not given a velocity profile over the area in which case we would have to integrate. Instead, we're given a velocity of 16 meters per second, which again, we, we have to assume that's an average velocity. It's only rational that they would give us that single value because it's an average velocity at the outlet there. So we write out our mass and our momentum balances as follows then. Okay, I'm gonna write out the assumptions very clearly here just so it's clear to everyone what's going on. I get asked all the time if when we're marking these questions, or in general practice, do you always need to list your assumptions? No, you don't always need to. I mean, it's a good idea, but it's not the type of thing where, I mean, we're gonna dock marks if you don't write your assumptions or not. So I'm just putting this here for maximum clarity. So most of those are given or obvious or we've discussed previously, except for number five. So I'll just quickly go over neglecting the weight of the elbow and water. I mean, in this case, we haven't been given enough information to solve it, so we basically have no choice but to neglect the weight. In practice, though, generally, it's not gonna be overly complicated to figure out the weight of the elbow and the water. So if you're looking at mounting a fitting like this, for example, you will want to account for its weight. But generally, you, in practice, you can just weigh the thing or the weight will be given. And the weight of the water then is just gonna be like the volume of the water that would be located in that elbow. And then multiply by its density to get the mass and then multiply by gravity. So if you want a quick rule of thumb there, I mean, if you're not given enough information to calculate the weight of the elbow in the water, uh, it's safe to just neglect it. Otherwise, probably worth considering because you won't really know whether it's negligible or not until you actually do the calculation. And in many cases, it can be considerable. Okay, given that, now we'll be able to simplify our governing equations here. So I'll write them below and I'll do it in component form now. We'll break it out into y and x so it's, it's very clear.
Okay, and we can simplify this based on our assumptions above. So we don't have any body forces because we're neglecting the weight of everything. And it's steady. The question says it flows steadily. So we don't have this term here. Okay, so what are our surface forces? Again, I'll pause here. I recommend you pause the video. I'll build in a small pause here. But let's see if you can think this through. The, what are the surface forces in the x direction? Okay, I'll label our control volume again on the right here. So we have the momentum change because there's velocity. And then in the x direction, we're also going to have a pressure that's acting on the left and the right hand sides of the control volume. So let's write that out here and then see if we can simplify it. Now in terms of pressure, let's see if we can draw this out and get a better understanding on, on what's going on here for our pressure surface forces here. Okay, so we're gonna have the pressure acting against the control volume on all of the surfaces. So let's sketch that out. We know it's sitting in atmospheric pressure, so we have atmospheric pressure in all directions. Now we have to take a closer look at the openings point one and point two. So the end of this elbow at point two, we said that was open, that's open to the atmosphere, so that's just going to have atmospheric pressure. But then at opening one, that's a sealed pipe, and the pressure has been given to us there within that sealed pipe as 220 kPa, which is higher than atmosphere, since atmosphere is 101 kPa. So we have to show at surface one there that higher pressure acting against the control volume. Okay, a lot of these cancel off, so let's just redraw this in its most simple form. So top and bottom, they cancel exactly. Left and right as well, except not everything, we're still left with the P1 acting on this surface here. So we'll redraw this now. Only this guy's left. And we've seen a few times in the past where we've done force balances. We need to figure out the force required to hold the elbow in place. So we call that our reaction force. And we'll draw it in the positive direction. And we don't have any weight, as we mentioned. So that's it. That's the total balance of our uh, external surface forces there. So now we go back up and write that in. wrote P1 with a G there, that's gauge pressure. That reminds us that we've canceled off the atmospheric pressure already, so we just need the gauge pressure. Okay, then I just rearrange that for Rx. That's what we're solving for. We'll do the dot product now, remembering that the normal to the area points outward and the velocity is traveling inwards here. Opposite directions, so 180 degrees angle meaning that's negative. So what that U1 is denoting is that's the X component of the velocity at point one there. We see from our figure that all of the velocity is in the X direction, so we can write that as follows. All right, that's our final expression. Can we solve this now? Let's take a look at each term. Pressure is given, area is given, density of water we know, but we are not given V1. So how do we find V1? So again, pause it here. See if you can piece it together. How can we get V1 based on what we're given here? Okay, if you figured out that's what we use the mass balance for, you're correct. So we'll write out our mass balance and calculate V1 first, then go ahead and sub all that in. So we've got negative for V1 there because it's entering and a positive for V2 because it's exiting. Okay, four meters per second. Now let's go and sub in for Rx. Just do a quick side calculation here so we're clear on what P1 gauge is. Okay, 
kilopascals is a thousand pascals and a pascal is a newton per meter squared. Okay, negative 1.35 kilonewtons, meaning that to hold this elbow in place, we have to hold it to the left. So it's a negative of the way we've drawn the positive Rx in that figure. Now let's look at the uh, Y component. Okay, so no additional pressure forces, body forces are all zero. Now I'll simplify for Ry and solve it similar to what we did above. Make sure we box our answers as usual so we know what we're saying the final answer actually is. So I'm gonna scroll up to the diagram here just to make sure these values make sense. We should always do a quick check at the end just to see if this has that intuitive feel of being correct or not. So let's look at the diagram quickly. Okay, so we got that both of them are negative. So what we're saying is to hold this thing in place, we need to pull it to the left and downwards. And those are counterbalancing forces. So it means as the fluid comes into this pipe, it should push it to the right and upwards. And this is a little experiment you can do at your own kitchen sink, right? So as you turn the water on, see if you can see it. it you should notice it kick upwards that little bit once you turn the water on in that direction. And that's because we have this force, this momentum that's exiting out the bottom here. It kind of acts like the way a rocket acts, right? Like when you have that fluid exiting there, it pushes it upwards. So that makes sense to us. Another way I like to think of it though is like, you've got all this water coming through this elbow here, like that, and then it has to make this turn downwards. So you get it effectively pushing against that elbow there, you know, in this same direction this way. So it makes sense that the fluid pushes that elbow to the right and upwards, thus we're required to hold it in place to push left and downwards. So all in all, that makes sense. I'll make one more quick diagram at the bottom here. This example, we had everything nicely in the X and Y direction. I'll just show a fitting where we don't so we can understand where these U and V components would actually come to play in a question. So if you had something like this, Now you draw a coordinate system, presumably like this. Most of those openings line up with the uh, Y or X direction, but V3 doesn't at point three there. So in that case, when you're getting the U and V components, you'd have like the triangle like that with theta given. And then basically you just determine the U and the V components of V3 using the uh, sine and cosines of the angle there. So that'd be the only difference. Okay, that's all. Bye-bye.